If I told you that the most advanced factory in your grow is a microscopic alliance running 24 seven, I'm talking about the probiotic microorganisms that work together like a living biochemical assembly line. Today, we're gonna zoom in on that microscopic world and unpack step-by-step -step how each microbe group makes stuff, how the others eat that stuff, and how the whole system becomes more powerful than any single microbe on its own. So if you're using a microbial inoculant, an EM style brew, or compost tea, this episode is for you. Let's dive in. The first thing we wanna do is introduce the different players in this microbial powerhouse. We have lactic acid bacteria, bacillus subtilis, purple non-sulfur bacteria, and saccharomyces also known as yeast. You can think of them as an assembly line of production workers, and each one has a specific job and produce specific metabolites that build on and add to the production of biochemical compounds. Lactic acid bacteria and yeast utilize easily obtainable sugars and ferment them and flood the system with acids, alcohols, and CO2. Then the bacillus and purple non-sulfur bacteria come in behind them clean up the leftovers, mine minerals, build antibiotics, and stabilize that whole environment. Each one has a specialty, each one produces metabolites, and each one of those metabolites are exactly what the other needs to transform and build upon. Let's start at the front of the line. Lactic acid bacteria are the acid engineers. Their job is simple and brutal. Take simple sugars and turn them into acids. Drop the pH and clear the microbial landscape. Labs ferment sugars primarily into lactic acid and acetic acid, and when they do this, the pH falls and the majority of gram-negative, opportunistic, or potential pathogens are unable to grow and stop competing in that same space. They also make antimicrobial peptides, little protein bullets that target specific bacteria. They produce aromatic acids, like phenolactic acid that shuts down fungi and molds, and on top of that, they produce exopolysaccharides, a kind of microbial slime that helps them stick to surfaces, build biofilms, and create physical structures in soil. They break down proteins into peptides and amino acids, and then convert some of those into bioactive molecules like GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, which can act as a stress metabolite and a signaling compound. Many labs also synthesize B vitamins like folate and riboflavin, and they don't keep it to themselves. When those cells die, those vitamins and enzymes are spilt into the environment. So labs does three huge things. They acidify, they defend, and they lay down nutrients and provide structures that other microbes can use. So essentially, they're setting the stage. Next up is Bacillus subtilis. Bacillus is built for resilience. When times are rough, it forms spores, tiny armored capsules that can survive dry, hot, low nutrient, or otherwise terrible conditions. When times are good, it snaps back to life and starts producing chemistry. And that chemistry is wild. Bacillus is famous for producing non-ribosomal peptides but it also produces surfactant, a powerful biosurfactant that changes the surface tension, it punches into membranes, and it helps bacillus spread through biofilms. It also produces antifungal compounds that attack fungal membranes and keeps pathogenic fungus in check. Bacillus also produces polyketides, and small peptides, which are antibiotics that target competing bacteria while also producing sediophores, like bactacillin, which are high affinity iron chelators that pull iron away from pathogens and into the bacillus cells. On top of all of that, bacillus also produces enzymes like proteases, which cut proteins. It also produces chitinase that can help chew up fungal cell walls and liptases, which break down fats. All of those enzymes work to break down complex organic matter into smaller digestible pieces like amino acids, sugars, lipids, so that all of the other microbes can use them. And remember, those acids and alcohols that labs and the yeast pump into the system, bacillus can oxidize a lot of those under aerobic conditions, turning 
lactic acid, acetic acid, and ethanol into CO2 and biomass. It's like a cleanup crew that's able to recycle plant metabolites. So bacillus does three things extremely well. It defends with antimicrobial compounds, it recycles complex organic matter, and converts acids, ethanol, and CO2 into compounds that can be utilized by other microbes. The third microorganism is purple non-sulfur bacteria like Rhydops pseudomonas. These are solar powered recyclers of this system and they're incredibly flexible. They can utilize light as energy source and they can grow on organic acids like lactic acid and acetic acid and can fix nitrogen. They're extremely versatile because they have a wide range of metabolism. In this consortium, their main role is to take organic acids produced by lactic acid bacteria and yeast, such as lactate and acetic acid, and use light energy to metabolize it. So while labs are making acids, the purple non-sulfur bacteria are consuming those acids, and this does two things. First, it prevents organic acid buildup that could stress the system or the plant, and second, it turns waste into high-value biomass and metabolites like hormones. Purple non-sulfur bacteria are known for producing growth-promoting substances like indole-3-acetic acid, or IAA, and the auxin. This auxin stimulates root development. It also produces 5-ALA, which is a precursor in the production of chlorophyll biosynthesis. So as purple non-sulfur bacteria cleans up acids, they also pump out compounds that tell plants to grow more roots and to build more chlorophyll, essentially just to be more productive. They also make polysaccharides and pigments. They produce carotenoids, which protect against oxidative stress and shape the light environment. And those polysaccharides help to build biofilms, which aggregate soil particles and helps nutrients stick to roots. And under the right conditions, purple non-sulfur bacteria can fix nitrogen and release ammonium or related nitrogen forms, adding yet another nutrient stream to that network. So purple non-sulfur bacteria integrates three big things into the system. Energy from light, the cycling of organic waste, and creating plant signaling molecules. They essentially convert all of the waste from the bacteria into complex hormones and enzymes and growth signals. The last microorganism that we're going to be talking about is Saccharomyces, which is your classic brewer's yeast. Saccharomyces are fermentation specialists. It loves sugar. Give it sugar and it will rapidly convert that sugar. In the early stages of mixed culture, yeast and lab often run side by side, burning through those simple sugars. And as yeast ferments, it produces ethanol and CO2 in large amounts and produces glycerol to balance redox and protect itself. It makes organic acids like acetate and it produces alcohols and esters from amino acid metabolism. This chemistry reshapes what can live in that environment. Moderate ethanol levels and lower pH wipe out a lot of sensitive microbes, but the lactic acid bacteria, the bacillus, and the purple non-sulfur bacteria are relatively tolerant, especially because they have the ability to produce spores, biofilms, and protective matrices. Then there's the yeast bodies themselves. Saccharomyces cell walls are rich in mannoproteins and B-glucans, and when yeast cells die or lice, those cell wall compartments and their internal goodies, like amino acids, peptides, B vitamins, and nutrients, spill back into the environment feeding other microbes. Bacteria like the bacillus can use protease to break down those yeast biomass further, helping to fuel that consortium's metabolisms. So Saccharomyces plays a dual role. It's the first to convert sugar and reshape the environment with the production of ethanol and CO2, and later its biomass is converted into a nutrient cocktail and released into the environment for the other microorganisms to use. And now that we've gone over the four major groups of microorganisms, I want to talk about how they feed each other. Let's first talk about the organic acids. The labs and the yeast are the major producers of lactic and acetic acid and other organic acids. Those acids all lower pH and are great for defense. 
but they're also a carbon currency because they are organic carbon molecules. The bacillus can oxidize those organic acids and the purple non-sulfur bacteria can also metabolize those same acids using light as energy. Organic acids flow from lactic acid bacteria and yeast to the bacillus and the purple non-sulfur bacteria. Next are the alcohols and glycerol. Yeast floods the system with ethanol and that ethanol is antimicrobial at first narrowing down the entire community, but later the bacillus and the purple non-sulfur bacteria can oxidize ethanol as a carbon and an electron source, essentially increasing the energy state of that system. And it's the same story with glycerol. It starts as a yeast stress metabolite and ends up as an energy source for all of the other bacteria. Next, we have the polysaccharides that create structure. Lab and purple non-sulfur bacteria make these polysaccharides. Yeast contributes manoproteins and glucans as it dies, and together those form a hydrated, sticky biofilm matrix that traps water, nutrients, vitamins, hormones, and metals. It creates gradients, oxygen-rich on the outside and more anaerobic on the inside. The lab and yeast colonize the interior pockets while bacillus and purple non-sulfur bacteria dominate the outer layers. Bacillus enzymes constantly remodel this matrix, breaking endopolysaccharides and cell wall fragments back into sugars and amino acids, feeding the whole community and keeping the structure from going inert. Bacillus and yeast liberate amino acids from proteins and the lab transform some of them into derivatives like GABA and phenolactic acid. All four groups of microorganisms can use the amino acids as both a nitrogen and carbon source. Then you have vitamins and redox buffers. You have labs that produce B vitamins and purple non-sulfur bacteria and yeast that provide additional vitamins plus carotenoids and glutathione. These leak or are released upon cell death and get shared around reducing biosynthetic burden on individual species. And finally, there are defense compounds. Every one of these different microbes contributes to a different type of antimicrobial compound, including peptides, polyketides, and organic acids. Together they build a critical moat around the consortium that is hard for other pathogens to cross. This cross-feeding action between the microbial consortium makes it so nothing is wasted. What one species excretes, another species treats as food, energy, or housing. So when we zoom in, we can see a living assembly line where stage one, lab and yeast convert sugar into amino acids, they drop pH, produce ethanol, organic compounds, and CO2, and they set the initial conditions to outcompete pathogens and boost synergy between the consortium. Stage two is the biofilm and polysaccharide matrix that are formed that captures yeast as it dies and releases nutrients back into the system, where things like bacillus will break down cell walls and convert proteins into amino acids that feed the system as a whole while photosynthetic bacteria convert lactic acid and acetate into plant growth promoters. It may seem complicated, but this microbial consortium has the ability to use each other's metabolites to build upon and create more complex beneficial compound that feed both the microbial consortium, stimulate plant defenses, and stimulate growth regulation. So if you're formulating a new inoculant, brewing a microbial tea, or you're just trying to decide which products actually make sense together, you have to ask yourself who's acidifying, who's defending, who's recycling, and who's signaling the plant. When those rules are covered and compatible, the chemistry tends to take care of itself.